Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 19. And uh, we're going to share a lot of verses today from God's Word. Uh, we're going to begin with our focal chapter in our series, John 19, and in verse 1. As soon as you make your way there, we will get rolling here. This is what John records. Then, Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in purple. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Now move down to verse 16. So, they delivered him over to be crucified. And they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus in between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Billy Graham, I wanted to give you that quote. Billy Graham says, God proved his love on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. I don't know what you think of when you see a cross, but that's the message that we have from the cross of Christ the cross is the focal point of all of history. Everything hangs on, on the cross. Everything in the cross. The Christian faith has what no other religion has. Uh, no one else has a suffering Savior who died on a cross. A lot of other religions, philosophies, have great teachers. They have famous martyrs who lay down their lives. But only... Biblical Christianity has a cross. Only Christianity has a salvation plan so unique. Every other religion of the world, and this includes many who call themselves Christians, but they still follow the self-improvement plan. Or Their symbol really shouldn't be a cross. It should be a ladder. It's trying to climb up to impress God, to please God. And if I can do enough good things, enough religious things, and climb high enough on the ladder, somehow that will overcome my sin, and, and, and everything's going to be good between me and God. Only biblical Christianity has a cross. And instead of trying to climb up to Him, it's a story of God coming down to us, and, and living among us, and Him paying the price for sin at the cross. That... That our eternal life and forgiveness of sin and relationship to God would not be based on what we do, but it's all based on what Jesus has done. And that makes what we do here different than most places. The people of the world, world religions have long despised the cross. The Bible says that people would misunderstand it, despise it, hate it, disregard it, stumble over it. The Jews of Jesus' day just couldn't imagine a Messiah. Uh, the Messiah coming and dying. Messiahs don't die. The Romans saw a dying God as weak, below their uh, worth, their allegiance. Gods are not murdered by martyrs, by, by, by mortals. Islam uh, rejects the cross of Christ, saying it's inappropriate that God's prophet would surrender his life to such an end. Gandhi, the great Hindu leader, couldn't bring himself to accept Jesus as more than a teacher or a martyr. It's no different today. How, how can something so despised and rejected, this instrument of execution, a suffering Savior, be the, be the axis that the whole world turns on? To understand the cross is to understand God. To stare at the cross is to get the clearest, deepest look into the heart of God. 
the, the hymn writer, we've sang, we've sang about the cross all morning today. That's when I survey the wondrous cross. It's when I consider the cross, when I look at what Jesus did for me at the cross. What do you see? What do you sense? What do you feel? What does God say to you from the cross? Now, we have this cross. One of the things you learn about crosses and you study the ancient world is there are a lot of different kinds of crosses. Sometimes you see the really tall cross, which would have been unusual because it was complicated. Crucifixion, the Romans were of all things efficient. And a really tall cross is inefficient. Also, it's hard to find big trees in, uh, in that part of the world. Most trees are smaller. And so most crosses would be smaller. This isn't too far off. Average man, average Jewish man in the first century was about five feet tall. So a big cross wasn't so necessary. You have a cross this size. It's easy to do the things you need to carry out the execution, to manage the situation, to keep them close and and available. So this probably isn't too far off from what most crosses would have been. Sometimes when they crucified, they just tied their arms in Jesus' case, probably tied his arms and drove the spikes through his wrist. Not so much here because the chance of tearing out would be too great. Through the wrist. Sometimes uh, foot over foot. But you see the, the complication of that for a lot of people uh, and for the people carrying out the execution. Sometimes they had a small platform and they would nail their feet to the platform Sometimes it's foot over foot. In the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem, there is uh, an ankle bone that they found a few years ago. And uh, it shows they put the foot on the outside of the cross and nailed it through the ankle bone to attach it to the cross. And that was the way they carried out the execution. Sometimes it just depended on the Roman soldier. It depended on what they had available. depended on their preference for carrying it out. Uh, And uh, they found plenty of creative ways to carry out the execution of people at crosses. At the cross, what we find is a definition of God's love for us. An example of love he has set. And what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through seven things that Jesus said from the cross. The, The closer to the ground, not quite so extensive cross. You see 10-foot crosses in artistic drawings. Um, Most crosses were going to be a lot closer to the ground. When Jesus spoke from the cross, it wasn't complicated for the people who were around at the execution to hear every word he said. Uh, He was available to them close by, and that's why the words are recorded. Some of these are in John chapter 19. Some of them are in other places in God's Word. Seven times Jesus spoke from the cross. And we want to look at the seven things he said. And the seven things he said are such a powerful demonstration of his love for us. Here is love's first word. Luke 23, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's something you may not have ever realized about that statement. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, Jesus said is a verb tense, it's an imperfect verb tense is what it's called, and doesn't mean it's not, it's not good. It, it, it talks about he said it, and then he said it again, and then he said it again, and then he said it again. So, the soldiers take him to the place of execution. Father, forgive them. They throw him to the ground, tie his arms to the Crossbar of the cross. Father, forgive them. They nail his hands and feet to the cross. Father, forgive them. They raise the cross and drop it into its hole. Father, forgive them. They taunt him and they mock him as he hangs on the cross. Father, forgive them. The soldiers gamble for his clothes. Father, forgive them. The disciples still running. Father, forgive them. 
We don't know how many times he said that prayer, but we know he said it more than once because of the word that is used in these words. Father, forgive them, reveal the heart of Christ. Jesus died on the cross that we might have forgiveness of sin. And this is so core to his character. His love and his grace shine in this prayer he prayed from the cross. If on that day, on that occasion, on a Friday, on the cross, Jesus could pray that prayer, I just have to think he has a little room for forgiveness for me too. And he has room for forgiving each one of you. Uh, there is room at the cross to find forgiveness. In this prayer, you see the example of Jesus. He loved even his enemies. He prayed for those who persecuted him. He, and he practiced what he taught. Remember what he taught. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, again, Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus offers forgiveness freely, often, and completely by grace, undeserved by the people he's offering it to. Jesus came to bring us forgiveness. Forgiveness for no less than the people who were carrying out his crucifixion. It wasn't like, man, I feel, really, I feel really bad about this, Jesus. No, they didn't feel bad about it. They were just doing their job, carrying out what they've done multiple times as executioners. And while they were carrying out the execution, Father, forgive them in the midst of continuing to do what they do. If there is room for them to find forgiveness through Christ, there is room for each one of us, no matter where you've been and where you are. Love's gift to each of us today, forgiveness. The second word from the cross, he said, Jesus, the thief, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus is dying on the cross for the sins of the world. His friends have deserted him. One of his disciples has betrayed him. His enemies are gloating and hurling insults, and he is dying a terrible, painful death, one of the most uh, awful things that sinful people ever came up with to carry out a death penalty. And he's in, the, he's in a center cross, the Bible tells us. On one side is a thief. On the other side is a thief. And those two guys, they're, they're dying because they earned a death penalty. They have done things worthy of dead. And the Bible tells us that they started out, again, people are gathered around, ah, you know, that you said you could save others, save yourself, and, uh, you, you say you're the king of the Jews, come down, hot shot, and that just constantly bombarding Jesus. Well, one of these guys, he joins in, going after Jesus, hurling insults. The other does for a while, but somewhere along the way in the six hours, one Friday, this other thief on the, one of those crosses, he just starts seeing something in Jesus he's not seeing himself. He sees, some, he sees some resources that he is lacking. He sees Jesus dying a different kind of death for a different purpose with a different sense of overcoming. And he, he confronts the other thief, his partner in crime in all likelihood. And he does what everybody has to do. He told, he told the other thief, we are dying for a reason, because we deserve this. We earned this penalty of death. This man has done nothing, confessing his sin before the Lord. And then Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I'm a guy hanging on a cross next to a guy hanging on a cross, but I'm putting all my faith in whatever he has. I'm pretty sure he's going to go beyond this, this point, and I want to be with him. And he puts all his faith in Jesus as his only hope beyond death. And he placed his faith well. Truly I say to you, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Here's this guy. He, for, for all the biblical record, he had lived for himself his whole life. Mean, evil, destructive, brutal, a murderer, a thief. He hadn't... Uh, he hadn't climbed very far on any kind of ladder toward God and hadn't attempted it. He was the kind of guy that, uh, no record, he ever went to church, he ever did a good deed, gave to the poor, 
cared about anyone but himself, and all he had, uh, just one thing to offer to the Savior, the same thing anyone here, if you're going to have your sin forgiven, you're going to spend eternity with the Lord, there's only one way that's ever going to happen. It's the same way this, this repentant thief did. The psalmist said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. I have nothing, and I'm putting everything at the feet of Jesus. Jesus reaches out in love and grace to this guy. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Now think about this. So here's this guy. He's lived for himself, lived this rotten life, been a terrible person. Today you will, that guy will be with me in paradise. He offers him the same heaven that his mother, Mary, is going to be in, and John the Apostle is going to be in. You're right in there with the the great saints of God. Today, you'll be with me in paradise because that's what unconditional love looks like. Jesus did that over and over again. Woman caught in adultery, the woman at the well, Zacchaeus who betrayed his own people, dishonest, evil to the core. Jesus loved people other people ignored, other people avoided, other people had given up on, and he still does that. He loves even... uh, even us. The Apostle Paul prays, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. We are loved by our Savior with all our mistakes, all our failures, all our faults. He loves us. The third word of love from the cross, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Most of Jesus' followers and friends had deserted him at this point. But there are some who had stayed, and at least at a distance, and at some point up close. And you know, I think when everyone else bails out on you, mom will still come around. And uh, Mary's still there. And we learn it's John who always identifies himself in his gospel as the disciple Jesus loved. Never by name does he identify himself. Always as the disciple Jesus loved because that so marked his life. And I, this is one of those moments when uh, we, we, learn, we learn in Luke, you know, when Jesus is born and all the things wrapped around his birth, you know, Jesus treasured these things in her heart. She was told uh, by uh, Simeon that... Uh, There's a lot's going to break your heart about this son of yours when they came to dedicate him at the temple. Now, she understands what that prophecy was all about. And she is at the cross, her son hanging. what's What's on mama's mind in that kind of context? I think it flashed through her mind again. Angel Gabriel coming with this big, big announcement, the, an angel speaking to her. Here's what's about to take place. Uh, she thought about uh, a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, uh, shepherd's visits and uh, wise men's gifts. She thought about Jesus growing up in the carpenter shop. Thought about the time when he was 12 years old and they misplaced him for a few days. You ever miss, sometimes you've misplaced your kids, not for a few days, but a few days. Had to go back to Jerusalem. They find him astounding the teachers in the temple. How, in a family emergency, she says, Jesus, at this wedding, it's about to all go bad because they are, they are out of wine. And Jesus performs his first miracle. Lots of thoughts. Tears in her eyes, we can imagine. And the silence is broken by Jesus' words to her. Woman, behold your son. Then she said to the disciple, behold your mother. Jesus entrusted his mother to the care of his beloved disciple, John. One... And that's all we know about that story. We see both of them showing up in the upper room in the book of Acts. But... We don't know much about this. There are traditions that say 
Uh, she lived for 11 more years in Jerusalem, and John stayed there with her and cared for her for those 11 years. Another tradition says John, when he transitioned his ministry to Ephesus, he took Mary with him, and she, is, uh, she died in Ephesus and is buried there. If you're in the tourist business, you want uh, to have uh, rights to that grave, and two different groups of people are selling tickets today. In this act of love, Jesus again shows his faithfulness to the Bible's teaching. He fulfilled his obligations. He's going to care for his mother in caring for the sins of the whole world. Honor your father and mother, the commandment says. Paul wrote to Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith. It's worse than an unbeliever. Again, for God so loved the world. Jesus loves the whole world. So much that he died on the cross for the whole world. And so you see this big sweeping story. But he didn't neglect the details. He said, yeah, this is important. But, but all of it's important. And he didn't step away from doing all of it. And fulfilling it completely. And accomplishing everything that God called him to do. That God calls us to do. He's not just, and I love this part. Woman. Behold your son. You're, I'm entrusting you to John's care now. John, behold your mother. Woman. Now, not many of you ever address your mother as woman. Woman? And get away with it. That's not going to go well for you, children. Uh, those of you who are in your 50s, 60s, and you say that to mom, it's not going to go well for you. But it's, it's a term in this culture of respect. But here, here's where everything is shifted. He's not just her son. He's her savior too. And their relationship is going to be different uh, and so much more blessed than she could ever imagine. The fourth word of love. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's that question, that prayer... Uh, stirs up a lot, of, a lot of questions for a lot of people. What exactly is going on here? Jesus asked plenty of questions all through the Gospels. And you'll notice when Jesus asks questions, it seems like most of the time they don't understand what he's saying. They, they don't understand where the, where the line of question is going. They're, they're trying to figure him out. Uh, lot, lots of mystery wrapped around Jesus. And this is no exception to that rule. They're trying to figure out what in the world is he talking about? They, I think he's calling for Elijah because like many of us, when God speaks to us, we're uh, paying about half attention. Jesus, often misunderstood by his friends, his enemies alike. And now at the cross, it looks like, well, this is the end. Greatest defeat. Actually, it's the greatest victory. Looks like all is lost. Actually, all is won. And his cry... To the sin burden he carried, that is, the, the, our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God expressing himself in his fullness for the first time, Father and Son. The Father turns away from the Son because he's carrying the sins of the whole world on himself. Here's uh, where it gets clearer when you read something like this. Jesus didn't say random things ever. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is a direct quote from the 22nd Psalm. You put a quote like that in context and everything becomes quite clear. The 22nd Psalm is like the, the gospel in the Old Testament. There's so many allusions and, and illustrated that, that point directly to the cross in the 22nd Psalm. Now, we skip the 22nd Psalm often because we're, we're moving so fast to try to get to the shepherd psalm of Psalm 23. Psalm 22 is a pretty, pretty hot ticket. You don't want to miss the 22nd Psalm. Images of the cross, foreshadowing everything that's going to happen. And the psalmist, he expresses his own despair, a time of great difficulty hardship. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist writes, why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Uh, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night and I find no rest. 
That's part one of that story. The Psalms are great with this. They, they throw, out, bleh, throw out their heart. Here's where I hurt. Here's where I'm afraid. Here's where it's rotten. Here's, here's where everything seems so dark. However, and they turn the coin over to see everything that God's about on the other side of this story. And then comes that glowing message of God's presence and God's power, God's plan about to break through. The psalmist writes, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. The the psalmist, he moves from grief to glory. And and he never doubted. The clouds were going to break. And the sun was going to shine through. And so it was with Jesus. Some of you today, I know you came walking in today and you're living under dark clouds. And times are hard. And you've cried out, God, where are you? And God, why are you doing it? And, And God... Uh, what are you up to in, in the circumstances of my life just now? And the answer of God is that he still loves you. He's still on his throne. He still has a plan and he is still working it forward. You can rest securely in his promises. And that's why God gave his one and only son. And that's why Jesus came. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You can trust a Father in heaven. The fifth word of love, I am thirsty. That seems really straightforward. There's a whole lot about I am thirsty. We've spent whole Sundays on I am thirsty. There's several things to talk about. The one that stands out is just the reality of Jesus' humanity. The word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus comes, he is fully God, he is fully man. He came to identify with us, the Bible says. He came to live among us to show us this is what it's supposed to look like. This this is what I want from you. And to identify with us in this broken world, to show us what God is like. There's a story from the Old Testament. I read the book of Ezekiel a month or so ago. Ezekiel came to live among exiles, and they were so broken. They're taken away from their home. Everything they have known is far, far away. And they hear terrible stories about what's happening back in Jerusalem. and They're they're so sad. So Ezekiel says, I came to the exiles of Tel Abib, who were dwelling by the Kabar Canal, and I sat where they were dwelling, And I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. Jesus comes as our great high priest. And he, in the middle of whatever we're facing, whatever we're feeling, he comes and he he just joins us in it. There's the story of the word becoming flesh. the The eternal word of God coming to us and taking on a human body. is a story about Jesus just demonstrating God is coming close. The Bible says we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus came to be among us. I thirst reminds us the God of heaven came down to become one of us, and his love is personal. He is not God far off out there somewhere, not God far away at a distance. He is God up close, and God so personal and so real. The angel told Joseph... Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And the gospel writers define that because some of their readers won't understand. Emmanuel means God with us. The sixth word, it is finished. Our lives are overshadowed. I feel this every day. There's this terrible sense of uh, incompletion. I get to the end of my day, and there's never a day when I get to the end of my day and say, everything I wanted to get done today got done. At work, at home, relationally, spiritually, I got everything squared away. It is, it's like surfing the internet saying, I got to the end. (laughs) You just never get to the end. We have a strong sense of incomplete. 
Think about this, a great warrior, leader of God's people. Uh, Joshua, he, he, he leads the conquest of the promised land. and He accomplishes so much in that, that terrible verse in uh, Joshua 13.1. Uh, where God tells him, you are old and advanced in years, which is always great. I always think about that. Okay, you know, when the ancient of days says you're old and advanced in years, you've crossed some sort of line. You're old and advanced in years, and there remains so much of the land to be conquered, so much of the land, yet not, not taken. And then Joshua, you know, he followed Moses. Here's Moses, the great lawgiver. He leads the exodus uh, who's who guy of the Old Testament, every imaginable way. So Moses, superstar, what happens? Well, Moses, Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land. He doesn't get to come into the land of promise. You sh- God tells him, you shall not go over this Jordan. But then we have Jesus. And it's not that way with Jesus. With a sense of achievement, Jesus Jesus, I remember he prayed, John 17, we had the high priestly prayer. I glorified you on earth, he says to the Father, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And then it's finished. It's finished. What was finished? Well, here's this life. It began in humility in a manger in Bethlehem, continues in obscurity of Nazareth, emerged three days later with a teaching, healing, miracle-working ministry, and it concludes here with a betrayal, arrest, trials, beatings, and the cross. And the crowd calls out, come down from the cross and then we'll believe. We believe because he did not come down from the cross, because he stayed until it was finished. Prophecies all fulfilled. His life of perfect obedience to the Father for the sake of the world that God so loved, it was finished. Sin, death, and hell defeated, it was finished. And the price for sin paid in full, it is finished. I think about three big times in history when you get that kind of completion. In the creation story, in Genesis, God completed the work of creation. It says, and on the seventh day, God finished His work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. Because it was finished. Jesus completed his atoning work at the cross. And he declared, it is finished. And at the end of time, the thundering voice of God from the throne room of heaven declares, it is done. It's all done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Here's the good news. His victory is our victory. His completion is our fulfillment. His accomplishment at the cross is our blessing. You you came in today, and for a lot of folks, you go, I got a lot of things just flapping in the breeze. I aren't nailed down in my life right now. A lot of things that I'd like to square this away so I don't have to keep thinking about this day after day after day. And it's a relational problem, or it's a job need, or it's health, or any number of things. And you say, it, it just... I can't just say at the end of a day, okay, that is now done. I don't have to think about it again tomorrow. Things uncertain, things unsure in life, but through Christ. Just know this, on the Labor Day weekend, God's love has it all nailed down because of the cross and the resurrection and the promised second coming of our Savior. It is finished. In the seventh word, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So, so six hours one Friday, Jesus hangs on a cross. For three hours, he receives terrible uh, abuse from Satan and from man. And for three hours, he suffered the separation of his father. But now it's all finished. Now the work of the cross is done. And Jesus returns. This isn't a my God, my God prayer. Now it's back to Father. And everything's going from darkness to light, despair to hope, and fear to love. And in that final statement, Jesus says, I'm coming home. I'm coming back to my Father in heaven. And I am safe, and I am secure, and I am loved. And he trusted the Father through the journey of the cross, through life, through death. Today, God so loved the world. 
that he gave his one and only son. But he loves you too. Not, not just the world out there, but each one of you. He knows your name. He knows your needs. And, and maybe this final prayer of Jesus from the cross is a prayer you need to express to him. Something like this. Father, I'm stepping into your loving arms. And I'm placing my life, I'm placing my circumstances, my eternity in your hands. I thank you for loving me. And God, I love you. And spur my heart on to make that love known to the world around me that so desperately needs to know that love. Father, into your hands. Everything.